Stockgen has said that bankers could work from home up to three days a week. Is that essentially a talent retention decision? It's between two and three uh, days a week. Uh, it's up to the businesses to decide. And certainly it is a, a strategy to try to attract talent. Uh, and young people are very sensitive to that. So uh, up to now, I mean, this is an option, of course, but it's, it's working and, and, and people are happy with that. So I would say uh, it's, it's the right choice uh, so far to do. Do you think it's a mistake that other banks some of the Wall Street banks are saying, you've got to come back. If you can go to a restaurant, you can come to the office. Why do you think that could be the wrong choice? Do you think, actually, that people have learned that they can do their jobs effectively and they like it? How different do you think the labour market is going to look post-pandemic? I think it's very difficult to know uh, how it would look like. Um, I think you need flexibility. And uh, just to be prescriptive and to say you need to go back to the way it worked before uh, the crisis is not necessarily the right approach. I mean, uh, you know, you can go to a restaurant, but you don't do the same things in a restaurant uh, than in an office. So I'm not convinced that this is the good argument. I think what, what you need to, to have is a, the right amount of flexibility to see uh, what is needed uh, uh, in the office, what uh, the uh, employees uh, can do at home, what's the best control structure, and, and, and then uh, be able to, uh, to change uh, over time uh, based on experience also. I don't think we have enough experience after the crisis to be that prescriptive. And we can talk about the hybrid model of working from home or in the office. That is, of course, one point that may factor into the talent retention conversation when it comes to banking. The other part is compensation. And we seem to have seen a series of banks either raising base pay, raising bonuses, offering other incentives. Can you just characterize from your vantage point how steep the competition is for talent in banking right now? Well, I mean, if I can say, in, in France uh, and in Paris in particular, uh, competition has gotten tougher uh, given the uh, migration from London to Paris of several American banks in particular, several foreign banks who have chosen Paris as their mm. continental hub. So clearly talent retention and talent attraction is, is putting pressure. Um, and, and of course we have to do our part. And, uh, you know, we, we have a, a regulation in Europe which is uh, quite restrictive because it allows to pay only uh, bonuses uh, twice the amount of the fixed. So there may be some competition and uh, some pressure on salaries uh, going forward. And this is a big challenge uh, for our industry. Um, some hints this week that maybe the, the ECB will be lifting limits on payments to shareholders. Uh, we've seen, obviously, the similar thing over in the United States. What is your expectation for returning money to shareholders? When do you think the ECB is going to loosen uh, the restrictions that are currently placed upon you? Well, the anticipation uh, was made this week. I think the formal decision will be taken uh, at the end of July, and it will go in that direction to go back to normal. Uh, also because I think this policy has not really worked. I mean, banks uh, have not used the retained uh, dividends to increase lending. I think they have uh, uh, used them uh, to, to increase capital requirements. And maybe we have in Europe uh, 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 enough capital or even maybe excess capital that can be returned to shareholders. So I think we'll, we'll go back to a, a a dividend policy which is more consistent with uh, the long-term expectations of, uh, of shareholders. Of course, the ECB, Mr. Benismaghi, is constantly factoring in the macro environment and what the economic picture looks like. What do you see the economic picture shaping up as in the second half of the year? Well, the recovery is certainly picking up and, you know, may even be stronger than expected. But... Uh, Inflation uh, is, is much below what it is in the U.S. Um, uh, pressures uh, are present in some sectors, but are likely to be temporary. 
So we have to, to look at uh, inflation over the medium term. And even before the crisis, actually, uh, the Eurozone had an inflation rate which was much below the 2% target. So um, I expect monetary policy to be quite supportive, uh, continue to be quite supportive. The, the problem may be more on the fiscal side, in particular if uh, some countries, uh, in particular Germany, if they may go back to, to fiscal uh, uh, restriction much more than expected. So I think we will have to see, in particular after the German elections, how, how quickly we will go back to, to fiscal austerity in Europe. Would you side with Mario Draghi, the, the current Italian prime minister, suggesting that actually we shouldn't be doing less in the Eurozone there's, there's a need for significantly more. Well, I would qualify, I mean, and he would probably qualify by saying uh, more uh, good uh, debt, which is more investment. Uh, I think the time of uh, increasing current expenditure is probably uh, close to being uh, over in the sense that as the economy recovers, uh, it requires less support of, of current spending, but it's, Europe certainly requires more investment, more public investment and private investment. And this uh, certainly is something that uh, will boost uh, growth in Europe and will make the debt uh, more sustainable. So uh, I would say yes, I, I agree we need more, but more uh, good investment, more good public investment. Demand for the, the new, let's call it Eurozone debt, uh, the, the NG debt that is being now sold, very, very strong, huge demand there. Do you think we've, we've crossed the line? Do you think we have now put ourselves on a trajectory within the Eurozone towards not, not mutual debt, because this isn't mutual debt, it's, it's underwritten in a different way. But do you think the argument has changed and actually something has happened that is, that is irreversible uh, in terms of Europe's approach to a common fiscal approach? Well, I wouldn't say that it is irreversible. I, I, I say it's the beginning of, of, uh, of a process. And of course, it depends... Uh, first on this money being well spent and so uh, uh, you know uh, countries that are more convinced about uh, fiscal rectitude recognize that common debt can be used well for the, 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 the growth of all the European countries and second I think it's important for Europeans to recognize that outside Europe there is a strong demand for European safe assets uh, European, uh, uh, good European uh, uh, instruments. And, and if the supply of these instruments is uh, properly calibrated, then it's better for Europe to have a, a common instrument than just relying on national debt. Uh, also because, you know, the, the supply of German uh, assets, which are in theory the best uh, rated European assets, uh, this supply is, uh, is going to decrease in the coming years uh, as Germany is going to go back to a, a budget surplus. If you have a surplus, you will have less boons. And, 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 and this will lead ultimately to the price of these boons going up and, and the interest rates on these boons going down, which means that the German yeah. savers will have to invest in uh, uh, government bonds that have a negative rate, which is not good for their own pensions. So hopefully this experience will uh, lead both uh, in the south and the north of Europe to realize that uh, 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 there is a demand for Europe outside Europe and, and we should accommodate that.